Senator Pan, would you like to present your bill? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Go good morning, right Madam ahead. Chair. Members, uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Members, I present to you Senate Bill 574, a measure that will bring transparency and accountability to the UC investments made in, in private companies by disclosing information that the University of California promised the California legislature they would disclose. In 2003, the UC lost a court ruling. Mm. The Superior Court ruled that UC must disclose the performance of venture capital funds in which it invests. That ruling followed two similar rulings which required CalPERS to disclose the performance of venture capital funds in which it invests and the management fees it pays venture capital funds. In 2005, the legislature responded with SB 439 by Senator Smidian that required the UC and other public pension funds to disclose fund by fund performance data for its venture capital investments. In 2013, the California Court of Appeals ruled that the UC Regents is allowed to refrain from obtaining investment reports from two from the two largest venture capital partners in whom UC invests, Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia Capital. This deliberate refusal to obtain these reports allows UC to shirk its duty under the California Public Records Act to provide this valuable information about the performance of these investments to the public. The apparent reason for refusing to acquire these reports is the UC cannot produce information pursuant to a California Public Records Act request that it does not possess. This is a manipulation of the California P Public Records Act and goes against the public interest. To date, UC has invested over $239 million in 10 Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers and Sequoia Capital funds. However, the public does not know the outcome of some of these investments because of this loophole. The need to put this information in the public's hands cannot be more timely after a 2014 analysis by the Center for Investigative Reporting found that the UC's $11.2 billion endowment produced the worst investment returns of the 10 richest colleges in the country over the past decade. SB 574 required the UC regents to disclose to the public the performance of investments made with any private equity, venture, hedge, or absolute return fund. SB 574 would close the UC investment disclosure loophole that has allowed the UC regents to forego the responsibility to be transparent and accountable to Californians whose tax money funds these investments and whose pensions may depend on the outcome of these investments. Here today with me to testify in support of the bill is Jim Ewert of the General Counsel for the California Newspaper Publishers Association and Carl Olson, the lead attorney in the UC Regents case and for several public records acts. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pan. Those in support? Madam Chair, members of the committee, Jim Ewert for the California Newspaper Publishers Association. Um, I'm not going to spend much time. I'm going to let Carl handle uh, a majority of the testimony here. But I just want to reiterate um, that uh, what Dr. Pan said is absolutely correct. This is just ensuring that UC hold up its end to the bargain that we struck back in 2004 when we created the uh, Public Records Act Code Section 6254.26 that listed information that would not be disclosed with respect to its venture capitalist partners and information that would be required to be disclosed. Um, and we're just holding the, them up to uh, their bargain. And uh, I'll turn it over to Carl Olson to get more into details on that. Thank you, sir. Go right ahead. Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, uh, my name is Carl Olson. I'm an attorney, and I've been involved in the battle to shed light on public pension funds investments in venture capital firms for the last 13 years. I represented the Coalition of University Employees in a 2003 lawsuit against UC, which required it to disclose the performance of its venture capital investments, and I played a role with the CNPA in the 2005 bill, which enacted Government Code Section 6254.26, and essentially codified that court case. All this bill does is ensure that UC keeps the promises it made to the legislature in 2005. UC itself sponsored SB 439 in 2005, and after months of negotiations with the CNPA, a compromise was reached under which certain information about venture capital investments 
would be disclosed and certain information would not be disclosed. UC's own governmental relations director told the legislature, and I quote, under SB 439, UC and other public entities would have to disclose specific information that provides a detailed account of how much the university has invested in alternative investments and how that investment has performed. Thus, interested parties can ensure that the regents and their treasurer are fulfilling their fiduciary responsibility to protect and maximize the university's assets, end quote. So UC's letter to the legislature 10 years ago spelled out exactly what it would disclose, such as the rate of return of its investment and how, many, how much management fees it paid to venture capital firms. It promised the legislature that it would disclose the information which is now listed in Government Code Section 6254.26b. Unfortunately, while CalPERS and CalSTRS are apparently living up to the requirements of that bill, UC has not. UC has let two favored venture capital firms, Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia, evade the requirements of the bill. And that is what makes the legislation before you today necessary, and that's why the bill only specifies UC and not CalPERS and CalSTRS, because UC appears to be the only public pension fund which is not complying with the law that it sponsors. UC uh, makes several uh, points in their opposition. First, they say this bill will somehow hurt students or retirees. Nonsense. All this bill does is require UC to comply with a law which itself sponsored. They told the legislature in 2005 that SB 439 would enable them to continue investing in venture capital funds, and they still invest in venture capital funds. Indeed, it appears the only reason they have cut a special deal for Kleiner Perkins is because some of the recent Kleiner Perkins funds have lost money and they don't want the public to find out about that. Notably, every other venture capital fund uh, has disclosed this information. Even Sequoia, when it was given an, op an opportunity in 2012 to uh, object to disclosure of some performance numbers, they agreed to that. Bottom line, when, in, when venture capital investments make money, they're happy to disclose it. When they lose money, they don't want to disclose it. It's that simple. UC also says this bill would get it involved in litigation, but uh, the contracts which are entered into between public pension funds and the venture capital firms invariably give the public pension funds a right to obtain performance information. It'd be crazy to invest tens of millions of dollars without the right to know how an investment is performed. And uh, going back in history, UC should have learned that lesson when they lost over $100 million in Enron and then they cried for the need for transparency. UC claims it already discloses performance information, but if you go on their website, the information on their website for Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia is 12 years old. Would you pass a state budget with 12-year-old information? Of course not. Would you give the public 12-year-old information about state revenue, expenditures, and salaries? Of course not. They're simply trying to keep the public in the dark about some of their key investments. Indeed, if you go on the website, they've invested $95 million in three recent Sequoia Capital Funds, and there's no information at all about the outcome. We don't know if it's been a stupendous money maker or if they just threw the money down a rabbit hole. I have a son at a UC campus. The last thing I or anyone else wants to do is to hurt students, or UC workers or retirees. This bill isn't going to hurt students or UC workers or retirees. In fact, it's supported by AFSCME, which represents UC workers. The only thing this bill will do is teach UC a lesson that I would hope that it teaches all of its students. When you make a promise, you should keep it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Others in support? Brian Allison on behalf of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Uh, indeed, this bill is supported by AFSCME. It's a critical common sense, me common sense measure. Uh, we believe that transparency and accountability is important. For those reasons, we urge you to support this bill as well. Thank you, sir. Any others in support? 
Is there any opposition? Good morning. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members. Jason Murphy on behalf of the University of California. Uh, we're here today in opposition to this bill. Um, our opposition stems from uh, three primary factors. First, um, this bill seeks to require the university to obtain specified information on our alternative investments, even when the information um, may not be useful or needed um, to make investment decisions to ensure the university is appropriately, appropriately monitoring such investments. Uh, the fact that our investments, in fact, have done so well over the last several years, I think, speaks to the fact that this additional requirement is not necessary. Uh, speaking to the uh, Public Records Act issue for a moment, I would note that um, we do continue to co comply with all Public Records Act requirements as uh, upheld and confirmed by the appellate court in uh, California. Uh, secondly, um, we think it's fairly egregious to take the university um, uh, singly to apply this bill uh, to makes this information available in a way that does not uh, provide that to other institutions. The, uh, the unilateral uh, nature of this then um, does not require others to comply. Uh, and thirdly, uh, we think that we do express, expect potential litigation problems here whereby the university would have to go out and uh, proactively seek this information and perhaps litigate to get it. Um, with me today, I have uh, Tim Rucker, uh, Managing Director of our Equity Investments at the University of California. I'd like to have him make a few comments about our investments. Yes, thank you. Good morning. I'm Tim Rucker with the University of California Regents. I manage the private equity uh, portfolio. And just to give some context, the University of California was an early investor in venture capital back in the 1970s and 1980s when the industry was forming. Uh, back then, we, we, we were able to invest in a number of very successful venture ca capital firms. While well, venture capital is relatively small allocation within the broader asset mix of the region's portfolio, it's a very important return contributor to the university, generating more than a 25% return over the past 20 years on an annualized basis. It's an extremely, extremely important return contributor to the university that's funded effectively through private parties to a public university, okay? Very important. Historically, this has been the highest returning asset class of every investment choice available to us across the planet. Okay. An important driver of these return has been a result of us being an early investor in a number of successful venture firms, including Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins. Both firms have delivered superior returns to the university and have generated more than 1.7 billion, that's B with a billion, of profits on the $330 million that was invested. There's not a question of whether these firms have made a, a, a we've made a wise decision with these firms and whether they've managed our money with the proper steward and responsibility that you would expect. They've generated tremendous profits and the university has benefited from that. On average, for every dollar we've given them, we've received six dollars in return. Thank you. Thank you. Others in opposition? Our third witness is here to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Members, any questions? Go ahead, Ms. Hancock. Senator thank Hancock. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could I just ask who the, who the third witness represents? Hello, Stella and I, Staff Counsel, University of California. Okay, thank you. Um, so I understand the investments are doing well. I guess what I don't understand is then what's the problem with this bill, asking you to disclose on a more regularized basis than 12 years what the returns are? Thank you for the question. Uh, from my perspective, I advise University of California employees on responding to Public Records Act requests. And in my view, uh, I do not believe that the bill would have minimal ramifications in that we do, the university does disclose the information in 6254.26b, but this bill would mandate the university to affirmatively acquire and obtain information that the university neither relies upon or uses. So with my public records hat on, it's a big leap to go from disclosing records that we rely upon to 
mandating affirmative obtaining of information from third party private companies. So in other words, you simply look at the aggregate return and you don't know what the investments are and you don't really care. It, I, you know, I'm, is that correct? So I think, I think we look at our portfolio in context of all, all the, the investment portfolio is comprised of many investments. We, we never look at any single one investment in a standalone basis. You always look at the investments in context of all other investments. And so with these particular firms, particularly investor capital firms, you look at them in aggregate uh, within those firms. Yeah, so why wouldn't you want to know the aggregate every year? So we actually words, disclose, if we, we do just disclose had a great recession. If things went down, you might want to change the mix in your portfolio. So, so, we, so we actually do dis disclose the firm level returns that are current on these firms. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Hancock. Any other mm -hmm. questions or comments? Okay. Senator Pam, would you like to close? Um, yes. Uh, so I just wanted to respond uh, to some of the testimony from the opposition. Um, so first of all, they made they said there were three point three issues. Um, one was is that uh, they think the information not be used for, not needed. Uh, I think that uh, that belays the fact that we have a bill and we have sponsors of the bill who actually think it is useful and needed. And uh, I think that's for the public to judge, especially since UC is a public university. Uh, the um, other part, um, also the other interesting thing is is that. Um, uh, you know, we talked about we would like to have returns, and I'm glad to hear that the UC, uh, that the, the opposition is actually uh, testifying to the actual returns. Uh, they're claiming that there's a six-fold return. Well, then make it public. Why? So if you're willing to testify here that you have a return rate, then why not make it public then? Uh, so, uh, so, I mean, instead of telling us that you just don't have the information. And, it, and, I, it'd be, and I think that, well, certainly I understand uh, the opposition saying that well, you know, we're afraid that we have to ask for information. Well, I think that's a normal piece of information we expect anyone who's handling public funds to do. And I know that, uh, you know, the University of California comes here to the legislature saying they need more money. And actually, I, 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 I generally agree. But we also need to know where other sources of funds are coming, and one of those is from their investments. So um, I think we've addressed the issue of sink wide singling out UC in the, in, the, in the testimony we had in support of the bill. Uh, we have other, uh, obviously, organizations that invest money for the, on behalf of the CalPERS, CalSERS. They're able to get this information. Um, and uh, I'm not an attorney, so I can't speak to the litigation problem. But it's, again, I would speak, say the fact that uh, other uh, uh, entities have been able to report this data. And I, I, I've, I've, done, I've not heard that they've had significant litigation issues to actually, uh, as public uh, uh, fund holders to actually report the returns of their investments as well and been involved in private equity investments. So with that, I respectfully ask for an I vote to, uh, for transparency in our public university, the University of California. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pan. Uh, Madam Secretary, call the roll, please. Oh, can I have someone move the bill, please? Thank you, Senator Block. This is due pass to appropriations, Lou. Lou I. Runner Block. Aye. Block I. Hancock. Aye. Hancock I. Leva. I. Leva I. Mendoza. Monning. Pan. I. Pan I. Vidak. That's five. Five votes. Uh, sufficient for passage. We'll keep the roll open for absent members. Okay. Um, Senator Block, you have item 10, SB 665. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> Senator Block, I mean, Senator Pan. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to begin today by accepting the amendments detailed on pages four and five of the committee analysis. I'd also like to thank committee staff for all their work on the bill, particularly Lynn Lorber for, for all your work with my staff. Thank you so much. Um, college campus is a place where students should be free to learn and grow without fear of violence. Unfortunately, a shocking number of students are victimized by sexual assault in their collegiate careers. 
There have been several bills on this subject uh, recently, and it's, it's very unfortunate we have to do these bills, that the situation calls for it, and uh, we need to respond. It's our obligation. A 2007 study of campus sexual assault by the U.S. Department of Justice found that approximately one in five women are targets of sexual assault while they are college students, and that only 5% of rapes and attempted rapes of college students are reported to campus authorities or law enforcement. As amended, SB 665 will create a framework to provide important training on sexual assault to college students, additional informational resources on campus, and more rigorous oversight of campus Title IX enforcement and reporting. Specifically, SB 665 will require initial training on rape and sexual assault awareness and prevention for incoming students as part of orientation, and will require annual refresher training or information for all continuing students, and annual training for resident assistants, members of fraternities and sororities, and athletes. While each of California's higher education segments has implemented training at the campus level, SB 665 will establish these additional uniform training requirements in law. SB 665 will also require that information be posted in high visibility areas of campus, that information including the campus policies on rape and sexual assault, contact information for police, campus and local rape crisis center offices to respond to incidents of rape and sexual assault, and campus civil and criminal penalties for committing acts of rape and sexual assault. All these will be on posters. SB 665 will also direct the California Attorney General's Office to create a statewide Title IX oversight office. As noted in the analysis, the Attorney General's Office does not currently have a role in the enforcement of Title IX compliance, and students seeking remedy beyond the campus or system level must turn to the Federal Office for Civil Rights. Finally, SB 665 will state the legislature's intent that, victims report, that victim report services be available to victims of sexual assault on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week basis. The bill has no opposition. I'm happy to note that Peace Over Violence, the group behind Denim Dye, who are right now out on the steps, and many of us are wearing our denim, that that group is among the many supporters, organizations supporting SB 665. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you very much. Those in support of the bill, please come forward. Andrew Martinez, California State University. We do not have an official support on the bill, but we appreciate the direction of the amendments and look forward to continuing working with the author as the bill moves forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Veronica Villalobos with the Association of Independent California Colleges and Universities. Uh, we too don't have a formal position at this time. We appreciate um, what the analysis brings up and the amendments that Senator Block has taken, and we would um, like to continue working on fleshing out the role of the AG's office in this regard to make sure it's not duplicative of what the federal government's doing at this point. But thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members. Robert Frazier with the California State Student Association, which represents the 460,000 students of the CSU. Um, we also do not have an official position on SB 665 yet, but we have been very active in past legislation and policies that help protect students from campus sexual assault and also support survivors. Uh, we'd like to thank the author for his amendments and we look forward to working with him on the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mary Moyle with the Chancellor's Office for the Community Colleges. We also do not have a formal position yet, but we do look forward to working with the author. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Jason Murphy on behalf of the University of California. I want to thank the author for the recent amendments. We do appreciate those substantially. We do not have a position either. However, we do continue to look forward to the conversation as it moves forward. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, Ismael Contreras with the UC Student Association. Uh, we didn't have a position on the bill as of yet, uh, but we appreciate the Senator's work. We've been in communication with the Senator's office um, on the details, and we'll be taking a position this weekend. Okay, thank you. Any other, um, those of you in support? Any opposition? We didn't receive any opposition. Any question from members? See, the bill has been moved. Thank you, Senator Block, for bringing this forward. This seems to be the year of recognition of sexual assault. And um, just uh, you're taking the amendments. We're taking the amendments. And as you can tell from the testimony, uh, the bill is still a work in progress. We recognize that. But we are working with each of the organizations represented here. And I'm sure that at some point they, have, they will have overwhelming support for this bill. <laughs> OK. All right, thank you. With that, let's call the roll. Let's do that. Do pass as amended to appropriate appropriations, Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? 
Block. Aye. Block I. Hancock. Aye. Hancock I. Leba. Mendoza. Monning. Aye. Monning I. Pan. Aye. Pan I. Bidak. That's five. You have five votes sufficient for passage. We will leave the roll open for absent members. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Members, we have uh, my three bills and consent. Can I, do I have a motion for consent? Let's move consent. All right, let's call the roll. SB 409 consent, Lou. Uh, I, oh, let's, let me, do I have to, I have to go through and identify all the consent items? We should probably do it just Okay, all right, say, so sorry. those items on consent are <laughs> item 4, SB 409, De Leon. Item 5, SB 440, which is the Education Omnibus Bill. Item 9, SB 652, Allen. And item 13, SB 425, Hernandez. Please call the roll. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Renner? Block? Aye. Block, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Leva? Mendoza? Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Pan? Aye. Pan, aye. Vidak? That's five. Five votes. Sufficient for passage. We'll keep the roll open for absent members.